go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, if I could remind folks to please note these uh, sheets on the table in front of you. Uh, they have a QR code on there to uh, register for Grand Rounds. This really helps us tracking attendance. It provides CME credit for folks who can use it. For folks who can't, it still really helps to uh, keep track of that attendance because it helps us pay for meals and uh, keep things moving. So we'd really appreciate it if you could scan the code and sign in. Uh, it would be much appreciated. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Anjali Malkani. Dr. Malkani uh, has no conflicts of interest today. She <laughs> She joins us uh, by way of medical school at University of Calcutta. Uh, she went on to University of South Florida for pediatrics residency and then Stanford University for pediatric GI fellowship. Uh, before joining us here at ETSU, she worked at Emory and then University of Maryland uh, for several years. So we're really glad to have her and I think she adds a lot to the medical education here and uh, care of our patients. Uh, Dr. Malkani is currently working on a study uh, of cholecystectomy in children in the area, so she's actively involved in research, and uh, today she's going to give us an update on uh, GI bleeding in pediatric patients. And Dr. Malkani, before she starts, has an introduction to make herself. Thank you. Before I get started, I've been waiting for this day. I want to welcome Dr. Lihia Cruz. She's going to be our new GI doctor. OK, so I'm going to get started. I want to talk about a practical approach to upper GI, upper GI bleeding in children. OK, I have no disclosures. And I was asked to add this slide to my presentation. OK, so what are the learning objectives today? To review the etiology of upper GI bleeding, what to do in the ER to resuscitate the child, to do some risk assessment to see which kids are going to not do well um, and which kids are probably going to do well, what to do in the ER, okay, pre-endoscopy management, and then when you call your friendly gastroenterologist, what are they going to do at endoscopy, how do we manage the kids post-endoscopy, and what information do we have on outcomes in children with uh, upper GI bleeding. Okay, so before we get started. I'm going to review some definitions. So what is an upper GI bleed? It's a bleed that's arising from the esophagus, stomach, or proximal duodenum above the ligament atrites. A mid-intestinal bleed is anywhere from the uh, ligament atrites down to the ileocecal valve. And a lower GI bleed is arising from the colon or the rectum, so beyond the ileocecal valve. Okay. So depending on what the blood looks like, we can tell the origin and pace of bleeding. So hematemesis is vomiting blood. That could be bright red, and it usually signifies active bleeding. Coffee grounds, on the other hand, is dark fluid assumed to be blood. So word of caution, this blood could be swallowed nasal blood or swallowed maternal blood in a breastfed infant. So what is melana? Melana is very dark, tarry, pungent stool, and it's usually suggestive of an upper GI origin. But again, word of caution, it could be a small intestinal bleed or from the proximal colon if it's just a slow bleed. Okay, slow paced bleeding could cause melana too. What's hematochesia? It's bright red blood per rectum. It's usually suggestive of a lower GI bleed. Once again, caution. It can be a massive upper GI bleed that the blood didn't have time to get denatured by the acid and it, blood is a cathartic, so it just whizzes out and comes out as bright red blood even though it's an upper GI bleed, okay? So we often say guaiac positive stool. So guaiac positive is just occult blood in the stool and it doesn't provide any localizing information and it usually indicates slow pace, low volume bleeding, okay? So take home point, Always get objective description of the blood um, in the vomit or in the stool. All the residents know I ask about pukes and poops and color and everything else, okay? So for upper GI bleeding, if you need a card to tell you whether there's blood in the stool or not, it's not an acute upper GI bleed, okay? Always get objective description of emesis in stool and avoid non-informative terms such as gro grossly guaiac positive, okay? So 
I'd look to see what is the incidence of upper GI bleeding in children. And you know what? There's not much information out there. Sad but true. So there was a population-based study in France where they reported an incidence of one to two per 10,000 children. Of these, 77% required hospitalization, and about a third of them had NSAID exposure. In the United States, there was a very old study looked at kids in the PICU, and the incidence of upper GI, upper GI bleeding was 6.4%, and the risk factors for having an upper GI bleed is if they had pneumonia, or they were a trauma patient, or they had coagulopathy. There was a recent, recent about five years ago in the UK, where they estimated 300 to 500 kids per year in the United Kingdom had an upper GI bleed. So I was on Google this morning to see what's the population in the United Kingdom and what is a percent of kids in the United Kingdom. And when I did the math, it was 0.5% um, of kids in the United Kingdom have an upper GI bleed. So you can see it's pretty rare uh, for kids to have upper GI bleeding, okay? So when we're faced with this, the first question we need to know, or try and answer, is this an upper GI bleed or is this a lower GI bleed? And then when we've kind of figured that out, what do we think the source is of this upper GI bleeding? And when we figure that out, then we need to figure out how sick is this patient? So risk stratify them, because that's gonna give you guidelines as to how you're gonna resuscitate, uh, resuscitate the patient, where you're gonna put the patient in the, on the floor in the PICU, um, and then it's also going to help us determine when are we going to do endoscopy. Are we going to do and when are we going to do the endoscopy, okay? So how do kids with upper GI uh, bleeding present? So they can present with hematemesis. Like I said, it could be coffee grounds or it could be bright red blood that they vomit. Or you could see melena, okay? Like I said before, you could have hematochesia, that's bright red blood pouring out of the rectum, nothing from above, and that usually signifies if it's an upper GI bleed, it's massive upper GI bleed that just ran through the GI tract. Sometimes you won't get a history or you won't see that they vomited the blood or passed the blood per rectum. It's all internal in the lumen of the gut, so they may just present with fatigue, one will say he's really tired, or all of a sudden he's pale, or Johnny passed out on the way to the bathroom. He just fell and hit the floor, okay? Or they just may have some vague uh, upper abdominal pain. So what are the causes of upper GI bleeding in children? I like to kind of think about it in an infant and then in an, um, or rather a neonate, and then in an infant and an um, older child. So in a neonate, we always have to think about swallowed maternal blood in a breastfed infant or, um, so as part of that, exam, I go examine the mother's breast to see if there's any blood coming out from those cracked nipples, okay? Uh, coagulopathy, either due to vitamin K deficiency, we see a lot of those now that don't want to get vitamin K, or sepsis, or they could have underlying liver disease and that's why they developed a coagulopathy. Stress gastritis or duodenal ulceration. Milk protein allergy can sometimes cause upper GI bleeding. The, any baby that vomits, or we call reflux, doesn't have to be acid reflux. It could be secondary to milk protein allergy. In fact, now in uncomplicated spitty babies, the NASFIC, and that's our society recommendations, are to try a hydrolyzed formula before starting acid suppression. Just a little plug there. So reflux esophagitis, esophageal erosion from reflux esophagitis can cause um, a neonate to have a hematemesis or if they have any uh, vascular anomaly in the GI tract. Okay. In an older kid, the most common things we see are kids vomiting, vomiting, retching, and then they develop either a Mallory Weiss tear in their esophagus or they have prolapsed gastropathy. So when they're retching that hard, the fundus of the stomach comes up through the LES and kind of gets strangulated up there and they have um, bleeding from the fundus of the stomach. Stress gastritis or duodenal ulcer in kids who are sick. Esophagitis, either from too much acid or infection, and I'll go over some of these pictures, or even pill esophagitis can cause uh, upper GI bleeding. Gastritis from H. pylori. Exposure to NSAIDs and alcohol. Some those ages seem to get younger and younger these days. Esophageal or ga uh, gastric varices. Uh, an important cause for upper GI bleeding where they have a high uh, mortality, morbidity. Once again, allergic inflammation, coagulopathy, vascular anomalies. It could be capillary lesions, venous lesions, and arterial. The arterial ones are the ones that 
bleed a lot, massive bleeding. The most common is a de la Foy lesion. And then rarely we'll see an aortoenteric fistula, most common from um, battery, button battery injections. Mm -hmm. So these are some pictures. This is a picture of the esophagus showing a Mallory Weiss tear. Okay. Um, causes of esophagitis in children, like I said, could be um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Eosinophilic esophagitis typically doesn't present with upper GI bleeding, but I guess it could. They typically present with dysphagia to the ER. Pills, teenagers take their pills at night before going to bed without swallowing any water. Uh, antibiotics, most commonly the doxycycline for um, acne. NSAID, salicylate steroids can all cause um, erosions in the esophagus, foreign bodies, and infections both in immune compromised and immune competent patients you can get um, HSV, CMV, Candida, and Aspergillus are usually in immune compromised uh, patients, okay? So this is a picture of um, esophagitis. The dark part down below is actually the lower esophageal sphincter, and above you can see the areas of erythema. The next one is um, classic ulcers for herpes esophagitis. Recently we had a normal kid with extreme um, odinophagia and he had herpes um, esophagitis. This is thick white plaques in the esophagus, typical for candida esophagitis. Okay. Um, this is, these are two pictures of ulcers. The first one is a gastric ulcer. You can see um, a clean base. Um, and the other one, sorry, the one on the right is duodenal ulcer, and the other one is the gastric ulcer, okay, from um, non steroidals. This is a patient with acute gastritis from um, Goody's powder. Um, and this is a typical um, findings on endoscopy of H. pylori gastritis. It typically causes a lymphocytic uh, gastritis, and it looks this, we call it the lumpy, bumpy look um, on endoscopy. Um, vascular anomalies can cause GI, upper GI bleeding in kids. Like I said, it can be hemangiomas. It could be blue rubber bleb nevus syndrome. Those are venous malformations. AVMs, we always look at the skin to see if there's any AVMs on the skin, which can sometimes be a telltale sign that there's an AVM um, in the GI mucosa. HHT, uh, that's Oslo Weber Rendu syndrome. And then the Dilafoy lesion is an arterial bleed from a mal malformed um, submucosal arteriole, and you can see there's blood spurting out at the bottom um, at endoscopy, it's arterial, and you can sometimes see it pulsating, okay? Um, this is a picture of esophageal varices. Okay, normally the lining of the esophagus is smooth and um, like the lining of your buccal mucosa, and you can see this is bluish and all these um, lumpy bumpy look in there, okay? So portal hypertension with esophageal varices can cause GI bleeding. So portal hypertension, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time. So the portal vein is formed by the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric uh, vein. So if there's any increase in pressure uh, in the portal vein, wherever the systemic circulation joins the um, portal circulation, there'll be increase in pressure. And you can see here, there'll be esophageal varices where it joins the azygos vein. There'll be um, gastric varices where it's joining with the short gastric veins. There'll be splenomegaly because there's high pressure here, so it'll go back that way. Um, there'll be um, caput medusae where the uh, portal circulation uh, joint systemic here, and you'll even get rectal varices from portal hypertension. Okay? So you can even get portal gastropathy where there's just inflammation, um, backup of pressure in the venous um, vessels in the lining of the gastric mucosa. Okay? So, when we're faced with a kid with an upper GI bleed, it's important to get a good history. Always ask about the quality and the quantity of blood. If there was any uh, retching. May I have your attention, please? Facility alert, code blue system is blue. Please proceed to the next Good. OK, so if there's any code pain. Blue. If there's any pain, ask about the particular pattern. If it's peptic pain, there could be an acute um, GI bleed due to uh, bleeding from the peptic ulcer. If there's any reflux of dysphagia symptoms, past stooling habits, bleeding from other sites is a clue that there may be a coagulopathy. 
And then always ask about medications, not only prescription, but non-prescription too, okay? Non-steroidals, okay? Alcohol and smoking um, decreases the mucosal barrier and can cause uh, GI bleeding. It's important to ask about birth history, if they were ever in the NICU and they got a UAC or UVC, that could cause clotting of the portal vein and you get portal hypertension. Family history, if there's any family history of atopic illness, inflammatory bowel disease, coagulopathy, liver disease. Diet, staple diet in this area, Mountain Dew, right, caffeine. Um, spicy food okay, can also cause gastritis. And it's also important to ask about past surgical history because they may have an anastomotic ulcer that causes an upper GI bleed, okay? So things to look for on a physical exam, always make sure that the patient is stable, vital signs, okay, hypertension, tachycardia. Sometimes if the tank is running low, you may not see hypotension and tachycardia initially, but if you do ortho, if you measure orthostatic vital signs, you may see that the child is orthostatic and that tells you there's impending doom on the way, so you better do something, right? Check the capillary um, refill, see if they're pale. Look at their skin, make sure there's no telltale signs of chronic liver disease. Look for vascular anomalies and the caput medusae. We always talk about it. I don't think I've ever seen it. Um, a murmur could tell you that there's underlying uh, hyperdynamic circulation. Abdominal tenderness, if there's rebound, there may be perforation, so it's important to um, make sure that there's no rebound. Feel for a liver and spleen for portal hypertension. And don't forget to look at their bottom, okay? Looking for skin tags, hemorrhoids, and fissures. If you have time and you're not quite sure where the blood is, you could do a rectal exam to see what color stool you got on your finger. Is it burgundy or is it black, okay? You all know about the Pew score to see when you're gonna get into trouble, okay? So the kid may look good, but it's good to do this just to make sure you're not getting into trouble, okay? Initial workup to consider, get a CBC. We're looking at the white cell count. Um, if there's leukopenia, you need to start thinking there could be portal hypertension. Thrombocytopenia can also be from portal hypertension. Anemia, how low is their hemoglobin? And as a gastroenterologist, I always look at their MCV. Because if their MCV is small, it usually tells me that this is an acute on chronic GI bleed. If it's normal, then it's typically an acute GI bleed, okay? Check their coags, make sure there's no coagulopathy, and also it's gonna tell you what their synthetic function of the liver is. So we always get a CMP too, and there's, if you have a high BUN with an upper GI bleed, it suggests that the body has had time to allow to, the body to reabsorb all the protein, so you get a high BUN. We'll talk about this going down. Amylase lipase, if you think the child could have pancreatitis, and don't forget to type and cross. Um, sometimes you'll do a Doppler ultrasound to see if you can find um, findings of uh, portal hypertension. There'll be reverse flow. And then a KUB if your exam makes you think that there could be bowel perforation. Okay, so look at the approach to treatment of kids with GI bleeding in two phases. The first phase is resuscitation, and the second phase is endoscopy. So we'll go through all these. So, it's been shown that early intensive resuscitation reduces the mortality, need for blood transfusion, and risk for re-bleeding. Okay? So IV access, place two large bore peripheral IVs, use crystalloids, place an NG tube, I'm gonna go through all this, and anticipate the need for... So we need to anticipate the need for blood transfusion, and the threshold is based on the child's underlying condition, the hemodynamic status, and markers for tissue hypoxia. Typically, we will transfuse if the hemoglobin is less than seven, some people say eight in kids, and it's always also important to correct that coagulopathy if they have one. So if they've lost whole blood, you um, will give packed red cells, but you have to remember some people do a three in one or four in one. For every three units of packed red cells, you have to give plasma or for every four, you have to give plasma. Okay. So let's we'll spend some time talking about the utility of an NG tube in upper GI bleeding. Um, so it's most useful when the patient presents with severe hematochesia and you're unsure if it's an upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed. So if you drop the NG tube and you see coffee grounds or bright red blood, bingo, you made your diagnosis. It's not a lower GI bleed, it's an upper GI bleed. So um, if you see bright red blood, 
coming up from the NG tube, it's usually predictive of a high-risk endoscopic lesion, meaning that the gastroenterologist, when they do endoscopy, they're going to have to do some hemostasis control there. Okay, if there's coffee grounds, it usually signifies less severe and inactive bleeding. Word of caution. So you can have an upper GI bleed, but have a negative aspirate, okay, in about 15 to 20 percent of patients. Why? Because the bleeding could have stopped or the bleeding is distal to the pylorosis. Pylorospasm and the bleeding was in the duodenum and you drop the NG tube and you're not going to find any bright red blood, okay? So you have to remember that part. So the other um, utility of the NG tube is after you've lavaged the stomach out, you've cleared the field for the gastroenterologist when they do endoscopy so they don't have to flush and suck out all the clots when they're doing endoscopy. It also prevents aspiration because you've emptied out the stomach. And in cirrhotics, if they have a massive uh, GI bleed, remember the BUN goes up so they can get encephalopathy, so it helps prevent encephalopathy in cirrhotics. And if you leave the NG tube in, you could see if there's any um, ongoing or recurrent bleeding till your friendly gastroenterologist shows up to do the endoscopy. This is a really old slide I found from the American Gastroenterology Association. I just want to draw your attention to two numbers. So this is the color of the NG aspirate. So you can see, even if it's clear, 10% of those could have upper, uh, active upper GI bleeding. And then if you look down here, if there's red blood in the NG tube, cause of death was 18%, okay? So take home points. Airway breathing circulation, NG tube is always helpful, and don't hesitate to place one. I seem to get a lot of pushback when I ask to have an NG tube dropped in a kid with a GI bleed. Okay, so moving on, transfusion strategy. We have to remember that the initial crit can be misleading because when you have blood loss, you're going to lose your plasma and your red blood cells. So initially, if you check your H and H, it may be normal because the child has lost both plasma and um, red cells. But when you've given IV fluid and it's, the body has had time to equ equilibrate, then you'll see the crit is down. Okay. So when do you give blood and how much do you give? There was most of these studies are unfortunately done in adult patients. So this study was from 2013. Uh, looking at transfusion strategies in adults with GI bleeding. So they had 900 patients with severe acute GI bleeds, and they divided them up into restrictive um, transfusion or liberal transfusion. So if the patient had a hemoglobin less than 7 for the restrictive transfusion group, they targeted their hemoglobin to be between 7 and 9. And for the liberal group, when the hemoglobin was less than 9, their target was 9 to 11. And they found that the risk of rebleeding was higher if you gave more Packard cells to um, increase the hemoglobin to a higher number. However, the primary outcome, which was the, all caused the same mortality rate at 45 days. So it's just in the acute phase. Okay? And this slide shows that if, you give, if there's a restrictive uh, uh, transfusion strategy, the mortality rate is about half than the liberal. And the risk of rebleeding is also lower if you have a restrictive. Um, uh, transfusion strategy, okay? And then the overall complication rate is down below, okay? So for coagulopathy, we check the PTPTT. You can correct it by giving vitamin K, but it's slow acting, so, but we don't want anything slow acting right away. We want something that's going to work quick. So we give FFP, and like I said, one unit for every three to four packed red cells, okay? In adults, it's a different issue. In adults, a lot of these patients are on aspirin or blood thinners, and then the question comes up is, you're going to reverse anticoagulation. You have to look at the benefit versus the risk. Luckily, in kids, we don't have to deal with this much. Okay? So in the ER, you've looked at their ABCs. You've typed and crossed, and you're going to give the blood. Um, I just stuck this slide in here for rescue therapy for esophageal varices. So these varices, they're under high pressure, and they can bleed, bleed, and bleed, and you can't get it under control. There is this tube. It's called a Sengstack and Blakemore tube. Um, we have it in this hospital. I checked. They don't have a pediatric size. So, so it's a tube, and it's got these two um, balloons. One is in the esophagus, and the other one is in the stomach. So you place this, and you inflate this tube, uh, this balloon in the esophagus, so it presses on the esophageal varices. Similarly, the gastric balloon press, applies physical pressure on the 
gastric varices to prevent bleeding. And there's a port here uh, for uh, gastric decompression so you can suck out all the fluid that's in the um, stomach. So it's effective for immediate control, temporary control, but there's a, and you have to attach it to this helmet, okay? Um, so there's a high complication rate of aspiration because there's no lumen up above the esophagus. So if there's blood in this esophagus, they can vomit it up and aspirate it, okay? And it can also cause pressure necrosis and perforation of the esophagus. So you only want to use this if you're in dire straits, okay? But you can use it. So I looked to see what are the outcomes based on the nature of bleeding. Once again, this is an adult study from last year, and they had um, 1,200 patients that had um, bright red blood versus 700 that had coffee grounds emesis. And they found that the patients that had bright red blood had, more, had to have more hemostatic intervention at endoscopy, 19% compared to 14%. And the risk of re-bleeding was higher if they presented with bright red blood rather than um, coffee ground emesis. Interestingly, in both these groups, if they had concurrent melanin, all the outcomes worsened in both the groups. Okay. So take home points, early resuscitation reduces mortality, place an NG tube and lavage, and then take care of hemodynamics with crystalloids and then packed blood cells. Okay, moving on to pre-endoscopy pharmacotherapy. So standard of care is to give IV PPI. It decreases the need for um, uh, endoscopic therapy and it reduces the proportion of patients with high risk endoscopic lesions. And I'll talk about the endoscopic lesions moving on, okay? We will also give erythromycin right before endoscopy um, to facilitate gastric emptying to remove all those clots so it clears the field for the endoscopist and it may also prevent um, aspiration. Okay. Um, so for non-variceal upper GI bleeding, IV PPI, why do we give it? It suppresses acid and it facilitates clot formation and we give it till endoscopy and then after that based on the findings on endoscopy. So you can give it either IV bolus or you can put them on a continuous um, infusion of uh, PPI. So the question is, what should you do? So there was a study done in adults again. There were 10 patients that were um, initially put on IV bolus, PPI, BID, then they had a washout period, and then they were on continuous infusion of PPI. And they found that in both those, in the, in the IV PPI bolus and in the continuous infusion, the time that the pH was greater than six, which is what we want, was equal in both groups. And the time taken for the pH to reach above six was 2.5 hours in the infusion group and five hours in the bolus group, but they said it was statistically not significant. Um, so I put the doses here for the um, continuous infusion group. Um, and we kind of extrapolate the dose in pediatrics from the adult literature. So this is what we use, okay? And for the IVES, we give three milligrams per kilo, yeah? Uh, it depends how sick they are. I tend more often, if they're needing blood transfusions and hemodynamically unstable, to do a um, infusion. Is that just for bolus then infusion? Well, you start the infusion with a bolus. Yeah, you start with a... Where they go? You give a one milligram uh, per kilo bolus, and then you do the continuous strip. Yeah. Um, so for variceal bleeds, uh, upper GI variceal bleeds, we use um, octreotide. Okay, it's an analog of somatostatin, and it decreases the blood flow in the splanchnic circulation. So it decreases the pressure uh, in the uh, GI tract in the vasculature, so that there's less uh, bleeding in the gut. It may also inhibit gastric secretion and may have some cytoprotective effects, okay? So we typically will give that for known variceal bleeding, but if there's endoscopy unavailable, contraindicated, or unsuccessful, you can use somatostatin in a non, an octreotide in a non variceal bleed, but you use half the dose, okay? So take home point, after you've resuscitated the patient, start PPI and somatostatin if you suspect a variceal bleed. Now I'm going to move on to risk stratification to see which patients are at high risk for having to have uh, hemostatic therapy at endoscopy. 
and which patients are going to re-bleed. Okay, so it identifies patients at high risk for adverse outcomes, may help guide appropriate timing of endoscopy and help determine disposition of the patient. Once again, all the studies started with adults. So there's a rock all score in adults. It's validated predictor of mortality in adult patients with upper GI bleed, and it has two components. It's a clinical part and an endoscopy um, part, okay? And if you have a score less than three, it has a good prognosis. If you have a score greater than eight, you have a high morbidity. And you can see as the score goes up, the mortality goes up. And they use age, starts at 60 shock, comorbid illnesses, and then at endoscopy, what you found, and if you saw any um, stigmata of recent hemorrhage on um, endoscopy. So that combines clinical and endoscopy. So then there's a Blatchford score in adults, again, that you can use in the ER, and it predicts the need for endoscopic therapy um, on the patient. And this is based on readily available clinical signs, so your um, heart rate and your blood pressure, comorbid conditions, and readily available lab studies, your hemoglobin and your um, BUN, okay? If the score is greater than six, there's a 50% chance that the patient is gonna need um, intervention, okay? In adults, there's a fast-track Blatchford score, um, and that uses a BUN, hemoglobin, and your blood pressure and heart rate, and this outlines at the bottom there, they're at low risk um, for endoscopy endoscopic intervention, if they have a BUN less than 18, the hemoglobin's more than 12 or 13, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is more than 100, and the heart rate is less than 100. So pediatrics is always falling behind. So a uh, British gastroenterologist five, four years ago came up with the Sheffield scoring system, um, which some people are using. Uh, were you guys using it? Not many people use it, though. Um, so he came up with this idealized scoring system, and it included the history, whether they had any pre-existing conditions, whether they had melanoma or not, if there was a history of a large hematemesis, I don't know what that means, um, depending on their heart rate, their cap refill, hemoglobin, and how you had to resuscitate the patient. So the total score max was 24, and if your score was above 8, then there was a high chance that you were going to need to have um, endoscopic intervention. Um, this we already discussed that. So we talked about resuscitation and risk stratification, and now the friendly gastroenterologist shows up, and what do we do at endoscopy? So when do we do endoscopy? So for non variceal upper GI bleeds, um, um, you should do endoscopy within 24 hours for most patients, okay? Um, and once they're hemodynamically stable. If the PICU doctor or the ER can't get them stable, then we may have to come sooner and do this. So why do we do it? We make a diagnosis, we stop the bleeding, and then we stratify them as to what their risk is for re-bleeding, okay? And in all upper GI bleeds, it's important to determine their H. pylori status to see if they need to be treated or not. So looking at stigmata of bleeding, there's a once again, adult classification that we use, it's a forest classification to see what's going on when you put that scope in. So if there's spurting hemorrhage, oozing, or if you just see the vessel that's not bleeding, or you see a clot that's sitting on it, or there's just a flat pigmented spot or a clean ulcer base, okay? So this is a spurting vessel, need to do something, okay? If you see a non-bleeding visible vessel at the base of the ulcer there, you need to intervene because this one might open up and bleed again. If you see an adherent clot on the bleeding site, it's controversial whether you should remove this clot and see what lies beneath and then address it. So you can, it depends on the gusto of the endoscopist, what they want to do. My feeling is just if it's there, bye bye, and I'll see you later. Hopefully not. Okay? So it just depends. Some gastroenterologists will go with a snare and guillotine this clot and take it off to see what's under there and then treat what they find underneath. Okay? Huh? Um, if you see a flat pigmented spot at the base of an ulcer, a clean ulcer base, you don't need to do anything. You just look, get your biopsies for H. pylori and come out. So that's low, low breathing, low re-bleeding risk 
and no endoscopic therapy is needed. So most GI bleeds usually resolve on their own. So you can see what is the risk for re-bleeding, continued or re-bleeding. So if they have active bleeding or you see that uh, visible vessel, there's anywhere from a 40 to 90% chance that this thing is going to re-bleed. So when you're there, you need to fix it. Okay? If there's an adherent clot, the chance of re-bleeding is 0 to 35%. So the gastroenterologist can decide if they want to remove that clot and treat it or not. And if there's a flat pigmented spot or a clean ulcer base, there's a low chance of re-bleeding, so there's no endoscopic therapy needed. This just shows you graphically on that forest classification, the chance of re-bleeding as this, um, the classification goes up. Okay? So what do we do when we go endoscopically? So we can inject epinephrine. We can do mechanical therapy with clips, ligation devices, bending, and we, now there's a new spray that's come out that you can spray on the uh, bleeding lesion. You can use heat therapy, either by contact or non-contact, okay? So there's lots we can do. So epinephrine injection, okay? So if we see a ulcer base that's bleeding and we need to intervene, with the, you can put all these toys down the endoscope. So one of them is an injection needle, and we use one in 10,000 epinephrine, and we inject small amounts around um, the ulcer base, okay? The problem with epinephrine injection is it doesn't work as well unless you do something else with it, okay? So you have to do something else when you do this epinephrine injection. So you can do either mechanical therapy. You can see down this um, scope, you can put a, um, a clip and the... Okay. Okay, so we can put clips down this um, scope, and you can see there's those two uh, clips down there. This goes and clips the area that's bleeding. Sometimes you can put um, a lasso, like a ligature around the base of a polyp um, if it's bleeding. And then we can use heat therapy to control bleeding, either by contact, typically we use multipolar probes, or non-contact where we spray um, heat through argon plasma molecules that are coming in, um, onto the area that's bleeding. So typically for contact, we use the gold probe. So the tip of the probe has positive and negative um, electrodes on it, and then we pass the electricity through that probe, so it generates heat, and the heat coagulates the area that's bleeding, okay? So it's called coaptive coagulation, so it's actually you're putting some tamponade, you're pressing the area that's bleeding, and then you pass the current, and it coagulates the area, okay? So as you coagulate the area, the, the, actually the temperature rises up to 70 degrees centigrade. The tissue resistance increases once the tissue has been desiccated and prevents deeper coagulation. So this is by contact heater, um, by contact thermal therapy. Um, sometimes we'll use argon plasma coagulation as a catheter where the gas argon is coming through and you're passing um, heat, uh, you're passing electricity through this and it activates the um, electrons and it causes heat therapy and you kind of spray the area that's oozing. So it's typically used for areas that have diffuse uh, bleeding, okay, for superficial multiple areas. So argon plasma or heat um, MPE MPEC probe. There's a new spray that's on the market now. It's a nano powder with cohesive and adhesive properties that gets activated when it comes into contact with moisture. So it forms a stable mechanical barrier at the bleeding site, okay? So put the catheter down, the tech on the end has this spray can and she presses the lever and out comes this powder and it will just coat the area and forms a mechanical barrier, okay? So the advantage of doing this, it's easy. You don't have to be on the lesion. You can kind of just generally spray in the area. You don't have to come in contact with the tissue. 
And you can use this as a temporizing measure. If there's um, advanced endoscopy is not available and you need to transfer the patient out, weren't able to um, stop the bleeding, you can use this um, spray. The success rate is about 75 to 100%. We just got this in our um, endoscopy suite now, this hemospray. So what do we do after we've scoped the patient? With low-risk ulcers, you can feed them promptly and put them on oral PPI. And those patients that needed any hemostatic intervention, they probably should receive IV PPI for um, two to three days. Okay, this significantly reduces the 30-day rebleeding rate versus uh, placebo to put them on IV PPI. Okay, so like I said, in all upper GI bleeds, we need to look at the H. pylori status and treat it if positive. And then we discharge them on IV PPI depending on what you found. And this is more in adults whether they need um, anticoagulation therapy. Oh no. Um, I want to spend some time talking about portal hypertension. So why do patients get portal hypertension? It could be prehepatic, that's something wrong in the portal vein, either it clotted or it's being um, obstructed by large nodules in the liver, so there's mechanical obstruction or there's a clot inside the portal vein, so it's prehepatic. It could be hepatic if there's cirrhosis, if there's just congenital hepatic fibrosis and there's um, there's resistance to the portal flow through the liver, or it could be post-hepatic. If they have constrictive cardiomyopathy, they can develop portal hypertension because the hepatic veins go from the liver to the IVC, so there's backup of pressure. So you can get prehepatic, hepatic, post-hepatic portal hypertension. Okay, I'm gonna run through this. So the definition of portal hypertension is when the portal venous pressure is greater than 12 millimeters of mercury. How do these patients present? They can present to the hematologist with splenomegaly or leukopenia, or they can show up in the ER with hematemesis, either due to esophageal or gastric varices. So the variceal bleeding often follows about a coughing if they have a cold, so the pressure is increased, or they have a fever and they have increased cardiac output, more hyperdynamic circulation, pressure increases, and the um, varices rupture. Or they've just taken NSAIDs for a couple of days and that decreases the mucosal barrier and that's when they bleed. So one third of this um, initial bleeding episodes are fatal, so these kids are really sick. Among survivors, one third will re-bleed within six weeks, okay? In kids, the commonest cause is extrahepatic portal venous obstruction, okay? In adults, it's cirrhosis. So you can see these ugly esophageal varices that are ready to pop, okay? Um, in adults, they have predictors um, for large esophageal varices. If they have a high child Q score for their liver disease, their platelet count is less than 88,000, they have a palpable spleen, and the platelet count to spleen diameter ratio is greater, less than 909. This is not validated in kids. I just had to put it there. So variceal bleeding in children, like I said, extrahepatic portal venous obstruction is the most common cause. They can present as upper GI bleed or splenomegaly. It can happen due to a hypochrytable state or if they had a history of umbilical catheterization when they were in the NICU. Okay, and it's precipitated by fever, cold symptoms, or NSAIDs. Um, so how do you treat variceal bleeds? This is a quick mnemonic variceal. So vasoconstrictor therapy, antibiotics, resuscitation, ICU care, endoscopy, alternative therapies, and beta blockage, not in this order, okay? So like I said, we use octreotide. It decreases the splanchnic blood flow. And once again, the doses are up there. We give a bolus and then a continuous infusion. Trolipressin is not approved in the United States. It's a vasopressin analog. And this is the only drug that has actually been, uh, had a um, randomized control trial that shows it's effective in uh, variceal bleeding. Antibiotics are indicated in patients who have um, liver disease and ascites, because bacterial infection occurs in about 60% 60 60 of patients with cirrhosis and a variceal bleed. And if they get an infection, now oh, she's found. There's a negative impact on hemostasis because there's endogenous heparinoids that could cause ongoing bleeding. And the antibiotic of choice is ceftriaxone, okay? Resuscitation, just a word of caution, if it's a known patient with esophageal varices, you want to be a little bit restrictive in your um, transfusion strategy because if you increase the pressures too high, 
those varices will continue to bleed. So you're walking a fine line. You want them to be hemodynamically stable, but at the same time, you don't want to precipitate more um, GI bleeding from increasing the portal pressure. Okay? Oh, wrong way. Um, endoscopy should be performed uh, as soon as possible after resuscitation, usually within 24 hours. And you usually have to intubate these patients. And what do we do for these patients? So there's a little cup that we attach to the end of the endoscope, and it's got these rubber bands on it. Okay, So you put the cup on top of the varix, and you suck it into this cup. That's the first picture. Uh, and then the tech from the, or actually you, from the outside can control these rubber bands and deploy them, and it goes and it constricts the varix, okay? And it just necrosis and falls off, okay? So you can see here, this is the banded varix. You've got the blue, you can see the blue rubber band at the base of the varix, okay? And like I said, these patients can re-bleed, okay? Sometimes they'll bleed because this thing sloughed off and they have a post-banding um, ulcer. And once you've done this, you have to probably go back in the next two weeks, and then they have a series of banding till you've banded all the um, varices. So once you start the banding process, I'm going to skip that, um, you need to put them on a beta blocker, okay, uh, because that decreases the cardiac output, and it um, causes spl splanking vasoconstriction, so decrease the uh, pressure in the um, portal system. And the goal is that the heart rate fall by about 25%. Um, at this, But at the same time, they don't get orthostatic. Okay? So once you've banded, you start them on this as an outpatient. Am I done? OK. Um, so there's not much data out on the mortality of kids with upper GI bleeding. This was a study where they looked at a pediatric hospital information system database. They looked at 47 tertiary care centers, and they had 19,000 patients with acute upper GI bleeding. Median age was nine years. 50% had other comorbidities, either trach-dependent, neurological problems, or underlying GI conditions. About a third had hematemesis or melena. 3% had shock. About 20% needed packed red cells. The mortality was 0.37% in patients with a principal diagnosis of GI bleeding. If they had a secondary diagnosis of GI bleeding, the mortality was 3%. Okay? 48% of these patients died within the first three days of admission. 20% needed octreotide. 70% got PPI. They were less likely to have undergone an endoscopy, assuming because they were so sick they couldn't undergo that endoscopy. And if they had multiple, uh, they had multiple comorbidities. So the um, trach dependent, technology dependent, neurological condition, or underlying GI condition. A lower mortality was associated with a patient who underwent an endoscopy, had a primary diagnosis of GI bleeding and admission, and got a PPI. So PPI and endoscopy were protective, the bottom line. Okay. Um, so approach, we reviewed all this at the bottom. Always when you have a GI bleeding, consult your friendly gastroenterologist and surgeon. Okay. Do we have time to do this? No? Okay, bye. Thank you. That's my favorite slide.